VMware 7 has launched, and VMware makes one of the best, also most expensive, virtualization platforms on planet Earth. But VMware now goes so much farther beyond virtualization. Like, get the idea of just virtualization out of your head. It does so much more than that. We'll talk about that. But I think VMware is making a big mistake with VMware 7. Let's, let's talk about it, because there's a little bit of nuance. There's a little bit of subtlety. All right, so first up, if you're not running a home lab at home with, you know, leftover hardware or cast off hardware or small, you know, tiny mini micro hardware as they, you know, as like Patrick from Serve the Home likes to call it, the tiny mini micro project. I love that. It's so cool. It's like you had, you got a little box and inside the box is a cluster. And, you know, there's 73 virtual machines in this unassuming little box that's not making any noise. Having a home lab at home is fun. Having a rack full of very loud equipment, especially if you live in an apartment, not to mention the electrical requirements of that, it's a little less fun. <laughs> there are fun projects like the Dramble. That's a Raspberry Pi cluster. That's a great way to level up your skills. You don't need much more than a $35 computer in order to level up your skills with automation and clusters and that kind of thing. Well, fact is, virtualization software stacks like VMware are moving toward that sort of automation and orchestration. Don't believe me? Well, in the past, you would run VMware ESXi. It's a great virtualization platform. You know, it's awesome. It does stuff. But now you pretty much also have to install a program called vSphere to manage multiple ESXi hosts. Now, in the past, that was kind of a luxury, the distant past. And now it's pretty much a requirement. And in fact, now you have to do that in order to orchestrate lots of VMs. I'll give you an example vSAN. So with vSAN, it's a feature in VMware that lets you spread your storage around to multiple physical hosts. The idea is that you run three or four or five or ten physical servers that have local flash, local spinning rust, multiple tiers of storage on each node. And when you configure vSAN, you configure at an application level how much redundancy you want. Sometimes the database server calls for like a RAID 10 type access pattern. Sometimes you need RAID 5 as, as just, you know, standby ordinary redundancy. Well, in the past, you would have separate storage and your storage administrator would configure those policies and then give you a volume into which you could dump your files. Well, now it can be managed directly by VMware. You just create a VM and you say, hey, this machine needs this level of redundancy. We see that also in Linux with things like BTRFS, ButterFS. You can specify how much redundancy you want. Those are good ideas, but it's sort of an abstraction that instead of having a container and an appliance that meets a certain level of redundancy or a certain level of storage, you're just doing it on a per atomic kind of a basis, or in this case, a per virtual machine kind of a basis. That's software configuration. That's, you know, software orchestrating configuration. Uh, it goes a little beyond uh, what you would expect of just ESXi to be able to do. And to be sure, ESXi doesn't do that. And look at what, what happens with vSAN. When you configure that with vSAN, it deploys agent VMs that are managing the replication and, and doing all of that stuff. VMware 7 adds the ability for NFS uh, exports to be available. So if you want to, you can create an NFS 4.1 volume that has, you know, geographically distributed redundancy. It's point and click inside vSphere and vSphere manages setting up those agent VMs on your physical hosts because it's aware of your physical hosts, creating files in the data stores on physical hosts in whatever level of redundancy you want. So if your cache SSD dies in a particular host or you have a particular mechanical hard drive that dies somewhere, the replications stay intact whatever level of replication that you wanted, it's all managed in software. It's all handled in VMware. And knowing this and playing with this and doing this kind of fun stuff is not something everybody gets to do every day on, you know, half a million dollars worth of server. You do it by playing with lower end machines. Well, with VMware 7, they've made the decision to rip out the last vestiges of anything that could resemble anything with the Linux kernel, partly because of the lawsuit, Let's not talk about that in this video. Uh, and partly because they want to leave legacy functionality behind. So you have hardware with these Fusion I.O. drives. This is it's only 1.2 terabytes. This is sort of a, a precursor that predates NVMe. So there's not really 
the controller on here like you know a modern ssd we look it's like oh it's got a fison microcontroller this doesn't really have that well okay it kind of does under here it's totally not a field programmable gate array that would be wildly expensive uh, that you can repurpose to do your own thing but this is a really uh, nice set of flash chips. This is this is classic. There's, this is hardware is, is desirable still to this day in 2021. Even though this is from 2014, uh, this is still really good hardware to have. Yeah, the capacity is starting to show its age. 1.2 terabytes. These are available all the way up to like 6.4, 8.4 terabytes. But these are no longer compatible with VMware 7, and that's because those Linux vestiges have been removed. So I've got a lot of these like a box of a dozen or two dozen. As, as we go through and, and update hardware, you know, HP and Dell were selling servers with this kind of hardware in it as recently as just three or four years ago. And in a lot of places, you know, they've got a 10 year service lifetime for their servers. Well, this has been coming for a long time. These are still supported in VMware 6.7, but they're no longer supported in VMware 7. And I don't really think deprecating old hardware is a big deal. It's just that so much old hardware is being deprecated by this move for VMware that it's going to make some of the home lab stuff a little more difficult. Because to be sure, this is not plug and play on VMware. In order to install this on VMware, you have to download a special driver and do some other stuff and jump through some hoops. And it's pretty crazy. You work at the command line, but that is great experience to get with VMware. And the performance from this thing is also mind blowing because it doesn't really have a controller. It doesn't really suffer from the limitations of whatever the silicon controller hardware was in 2014. When you put these in a modern system with a modern processor, it's basically, you know, flash plugged directly into the PCIe bus. Of course, the downside for that is they're not normal NVMe drives. They don't show up as normal NVMe drives. There's not a a driver stack, all this kind of stuff, because these <laughs> that didn't really exist. That specification was a glimmer, uh, you know, in an engineer's eye when these things were already basically in production. Facebook and Google and Amazon and pretty much everybody under the sun bought such an ungodly number of these that they are super easy and super cheap on eBay. In fact, don't be surprised if over the next six months as people replace VMR 6.7 with VMR 7 uh, systems that you know, you'll be able to get these for $20, $25, less than that on eBay because you plug them in and they don't, they don't necessarily work out of the box. I'm really hoping that VMware will turn around and provide some sort of backdoor unofficial way to claw in, you know, Linux compatible drivers. Like if you really, really want to, we're going to do this thing that's completely unsanctioned and, oh, how did they figure it out? We totally didn't, you know, backdoor help them into getting that working just to be able to support the home lab people. The reason the home lab people are so important is because it provides a skills pipeline. So you have people like me that are working in their home lab, doing stuff, doing experiments, and that helps me have a better understanding of what's going on. The people working on, you know, things like the Dramble. That guy is one of the most talented developer dudes out there, and this was an exercise you know, for himself to get more acquainted with this stuff. This is the kind of thing that you have to do if you're serious about your craft. You have to do all this sort of stuff that doesn't seem like it's fun, you know, home lab and other kind of stuff. Okay, the home lab stuff does actually seem really fun in order to level up your skills. And so I think that this change with the drivers and other changes that VMware is making with things like availability of some of these features in like a home lab context, like I want to run vSPAN, on a home lab. It's like, well, there's some gotchas. I want to be able to run efficient, you know, differential block based backups with my free version of ESXi. Well, hang on there. There's some gotchas. So even though there still is a free version of ESXi 7 for now, um, I really think that VMware is doing itself a disservice because Hyper-V and other competitors are catching up. Also, you know, honorable mention Proxmox. I've done a bunch of videos on Proxmox. I don't think Proxmox is gonna be it, but you can have a really productive system with Proxmox and another, you know, magical keyword, Ceph. So your, your distributed storage and all the kind of stuff, it's a completely different 
set of keywords. It's a completely different vernacular. Uh, it's a little bit different philosophy in how it works. And to be sure, VMware is a great product and they've got everything else on the market beat hands down in terms of virtualization, ease of virtualization, management, you know, data assurance, integrity. It ticks all the boxes. It's an expensive product. It's worth the money. But I think they're, they're doing themselves a disservice because it's making it harder for people to get the skills with this kind of orchestration. Ultimately, what VMware should be doing is providing the same level of orchestration and automation as Amazon. As a systems administrator, I ought to be able to go in and set some limits for my dev team, but turn my dev team loose with the physical parameters, like the physical, it's like, okay, you get this many PCIe devices, you got this much memory, you've got this many CPUs, have at it. And they've got an API for creating compute instances or creating GPU attached instances or creating instances that have locally attached NVMe. VMware does actually have a pretty robust API in vSphere. That's some of the zero day vulnerabilities we've seen lately. Ah, waka waka waka. But the fact that VMware is not providing education and a lot of really exciting stuff at the home lab level means that nobody's ever really going to use those features. Amazon is everywhere because it is insanely cheap and at least for like the free stuff they offered free versions of their technology why did they do that it's so people would be able to gather the skills there's a free version of hyper-v and it's not to give away the product it's not to try to poison the well it's literally so the people like you the people watching this video will have more skills with hyper-v and powershell and all the stuff that goes with it Microsoft is building the infrastructure to do exactly what I described with Azure. It's not there yet. They're still years behind VMware. But VMware, I think, is sort of missing the boat here. And I haven't really seen anything from the VMware side of the things that would let me do that kind of a scenario where I can turn my developers loose and have an Amazon-like API, like an AWS CLI type interface to my uh, VMware virtual machine environment. I'm getting there with Azure. It's coming. It's almost here. It's not quite here, but it's getting close. And this is a really exciting time for people that are doing home lab stuff because you can finally have a small, you know, machine or two or a NUC. You know, you have a couple of eight core NUCs with 32 gigabytes of memory. And then, you know, something like a Synology NAS for storage and iSCSI. A mix of the three, you can use the virtualization capabilities of the Synology to run your, your vSAN witness appliance. There's a lot of fun that you can have with that at a home lab level. Really get some amazing skills, and I've done videos on some of it. Could need to do videos on more of it, and if you do that, you're a lot more employable. You can make a lot more money, potentially, but also just have more confidence in, in, in your understanding of how stuff works and how to build stuff and see who's trying to solve you know the problems and and who's taking care of it to be sure vmware is chasing the dollars like their enterprise customers and and, and things like that they're you know <laughs> their ear is to the ground for those customers but a lot of the time it's like what henry ford said it's like if i'd asked my customers what they wanted they would have said faster horses there's a lot of that in the enterprise they can't think outside the box but this level of automation and orchestration for developers and system administration where i just run a script and create my infrastructure that's already here. We, we need better tools to be able to do that. And they're mostly there. But it's frustrating that VMware is making it harder for people to learn the skill sets by taking functionality out of the free version uh, and you know doing away with the drivers, making it harder to get good hardware that you know, works with, with VMware and that kind of thing. It's not all bad news. I mean... You know, just because I can't run my Fusion I.O. drives anymore doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the world. I mean, a one terabyte modern NVMe is around $100. So it's not a great loss. But they're also plug and play, and they're also different. The flash memory here, this is a lot nicer flash memory than what you get on a modern uh, SSD in terms of endurance and, and reliability. There's a redundant path to each microchip on this for Pete's sake. So how crazy is that? So I just, I really hope that VMware understands the nuance with the uh, the infrastructure automation component of it and doesn't miss the boat there. I'm Wendell. This has been a level one ramble. If you like it, you know, up dude. If you didn't, you can do the other thing too. I'm hanging out on the forums, forum.level1text.com. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.